thank you so much, uh, Sangeeta and all the organizers of uh, this year's conference. It's a real pleasure to be here to share with you. I've learned so much from the conference already. Uh, I do have to say that it's always a challenge for me to follow my good friend and, and colleague, uh, Anna, after she presents, because uh, she presents so clearly and uh, in such a with such great energy, uh, it's uh, tough to follow on, but hopefully I'll, I'll do, do some justice. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be presenting about the CDKL5 registry today. I'll be uh, sharing this presentation uh, with our uh, development uh, technology partner, uh, Dr. Famida Guadri Sridhar, who's actually the founder and CEO of Pulse InfoFrame to cover some of the more technical details, which are truly important for a, a uh, modern registry regarding uh, issues like data protection and data safety, uh, which is really her area of expertise. But uh, I, I'd first like to start by, by uh, sharing with you one of the first things that uh, families bring up when uh, we start to talk about a uh, unified international uh, registry for the CDKL5 community. Uh, one of the first things they say is, well, there are so many efforts that are out there already. How does this fit in? Why would we even need uh, yet another uh, data collection system for the CDKL5 community? And in fact, uh, you've all heard uh, the different efforts that have been going on. Uh, for instance, I hope, let's see now, I think you should be able to see my laser pointer now. For instance, the work of Helen Leonard, who's been doing a fantastic job for the last 20 years. Uh, even before CDKL5 was recognized as a separate disorder, she's been collecting data, working with families. Uh, other efforts that uh, are focusing on the collecting of collection of clinical data, whether it be the uh, Italian group uh, in Siemi Vesa La Cura, uh, or within the NIH funded study for natural history. This represents what a real challenge it is to our community. Because the disease was only described Few, uh, less than 20 years ago. There's still so much that we need to learn. This came out from many of the presentations yesterday. We're still learning about the symptoms and the presentation uh, and the natural history of CDKL5 deficiency disorder. Uh, we need to learn more. Uh, secondly, as Anna pointed out, with all the activity that's now going on, I think that we're blessed as a community to have so much interest from uh, different pharma partners in advancing therapeutics. We have to be sure that we're truly trial ready and that our community is organized in a way that we'll be able to learn about these uh, clinical study opportunities so that our families can uh, participate and that we as a community can support those clinical trials and help them move forward as quickly as possible. So when it came to developing a modern clinical registry, uh, we, we looked at this at the Lulu Foundation in partnership with the Orphan Disease Center and um, uh, Pulse InfoFrame, our technology partner, to ask what is it that a modern patient registry would be uh, asked to uh, provide to our families and how would we be able to do that? Well, first we would want the, the families to be able to share their data about their family member living with CDD in order to have um, the, that information drive research and enable research on CDD so we can learn more about the disorder. Uh, we want this to be available to the entire community uh, worldwide the opportunity to share the data, so therefore make it a truly international registry, as well as making the data available to the entire scientific community, both in academia and in industry without any limitations in order to allow as much research to go on as possible. Secondly, we would want families to be able to see their child's data as a way to give back to the families who are sharing their data into the CDKL5 registry. We think it's, it's important for us to be able to provide families with the ability to see different um, measures of the, their, their child's um, uh, progression. Uh, how do their seizure profiles, how do their medications compare to those of the CDKL5 population as a whole? How do they change over time? So we think it's important to be able to give back the, the, to the families the ability to visualize their child's data in relation to the rest of the community. We think that a modern registry should allow families to learn about uh, any opportunities to, that they might have to participate in different CDKL5 clinical studies, whether they be uh, non-interventional observational studies that we'll hear about uh, a little bit later, uh, or, or even eventually the interventional studies for novel therapeutics. We want to have an efficient and effective way for these families to be able to learn about that. And then finally, in the uh, part of the talk that I'll ask Famita to cover, we want families to be assured that their data are secure and that the collection, storage, and any sharing of the data are fully compliant 
with ethics regulatory and uh, data privacy standards, such as the GDPR standards established in Europe. And we'll hear more from that uh, around that from Famita uh, in a few minutes. But just to, to you know, begin the discussion about CDKL5 registry, how it's been designed to work as an international uh, community data source. Uh, the way it's set up is that using a web-based portal, families are able to share their real world data through regular questionnaires that they fill out online. Uh, in addition, the CDKL5 registry platform is set up such that we're able to integrate any other data sets that are available, clinical, uh, natural history, uh, data that um, generated during a, a, an actual uh, drug trial, for instance, integrated onto that platform and connected with our uh, patient community. So that's how the data are brought into the CDKL5 registry. And then what's, uh, let's see now. But then on the other side, how the data are actually used and shared with the entire community. Uh, one very important uh, aspect is the making the data available to the research community. And we, we have uh, mechanisms in place such that uh, different uh, researchers can apply for uh, access to the data, the de-identified data. Uh, they're available to both industry and academic researchers uh, in a way uh, that uh, protects the patient privacy, but provides as much information as we can to pharma to help drive the next generation of, of drug trials and therapeutics. But I do want to point out that, as I mentioned, Telethon Kids Institute, headed by uh, um, Helen Leonard and Jenny Downs, has been working very hard for 20 years now to collect data. In the case of Helen and Jenny, we've actually set up a program that will allow them to be able to share the data directly so that their data can be linked up on an individual basis with the uh, data collected within the CDKL5 registry to make that more effective. And then finally, as indicated here on the left, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we want the data to be able to also go out to the families so that they can view the progress of their family member uh, on a patient dashboard. And we want the families to be able to receive information about any opportunities to participate in clinical studies, observational or uh, interventional, with no obligation at all to participate, but just to be able to learn as quickly as possible about opportunities that they might want to um, take advantage of. Uh, as I mentioned, the, we have a, um, a relationship uh, established with, um, with uh, Jenny and Helen at the Telethon, Con Telethon Kids Institute. Uh, in a very particular way to help reduce the burden of uh, all of this data collection that placed on our families. Uh, with particular concern to uh, avoid any sort of uh, redundancy, asking the same questions too many times, we've actually set up a program with Jenny and Helen in order to, uh, that, that any questions asked within uh, the Telethon Kids Institute data collection uh, are not reproduced with, by questions that are already in the CDKL5 registry. Reducing that redundancy will help reduce the burdens on the family, families and will increase the quality of the data that are actually collected. The data that are shared between Telethon Kids and the CDKL5 registry is accomplished using a secure link called the GUID, which pre prevents any misidentifications of um, uh, participants in either Telethon Kids or the CDKL5 registry. And then finally, as a way to uh, further reduce the burden on the families, uh, we've recently instigated uh, upgrades to the CDKL5 registry to first uh, enable uh, more languages to make it truly an international registry, allowing more families to be able to enter informa information in, their, in their, um, their, their native tongue. We've uh, it made su su substantial improvements in the use uh, uh, for, on the user experience for the CDKL5 registry based in some cases on the feedback we've gotten from some of our families on things that could be improved. And we've made a big effort towards making the CDKL5 registry more uh, friendly for viewing and data entry on uh, mobile and uh, tablet devices, uh, just to make it a little bit easier for families to keep up with their uh, questionnaires. So uh, first, uh, with regard to Dan, you mute accidentally. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. So first, um, uh, one of the most important advances we've made in, in making the CDKL5 registry more international is to be able to offer it in multiple languages. 
Uh, in addition to English, we now have CDKL5 registry available in Spanish, Italian, French, and German. And uh, coming up next, um, before the end of the summer, we'll also have it available in Chinese, Japanese, Russian, and Arabic. This is truly necessary because as Anna had mentioned, and we'll hear more perhaps from Xavier, so many of the CDKL5 uh, clinical studies that are ongoing are looking into the international uh, community, not just say uh, the North American or European community. Therefore, we need to uh, reach as many patient families as we can, and we can facilitate that by making the CDKL5 registry available in more languages. In addition, as I mentioned, we've made some substantial improvements in the user interface, the user experience, in order to allow families, for instance, to pause, save the data that they've entered before they get to the bottom of the questionnaire. Because we know CDD families are so challenged, so overloaded with so many things to do, uh, we really took the feedback at, to heart when uh, families said, uh, one of the family members said, they really need to be able to save their data because if their child ends up having a seizure in the middle of filling out a questionnaire, they don't wanna have to start over again. So this has been uh, integrated as well as other changes that just make the navigation around the uh, questionnaires a little bit easier. And uh, as always, we're open to and, and uh, anxious to hear any other feedback from families of uh, suggestions they might have for improvement, the challenges that they found with either the, the, the functioning of the website or the questions that we're asking. Always looking for ways to improve. As I mentioned, uh, Pulse Info Frame has been great at helping to um, uh, enable the viewing of the CDKL5 registry platform on mobile devices with everyone on the go spending so much time on their phones, better to get notifications and um, other information about the registry on your phone rather than having to wait till you sit down in front of a PC. So we think that this is something that will make the overall experience less burdensome on the families. And then finally, as we mentioned, uh, it's important for us to be able to give back to the families who are giving so much in sharing their data. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of detail here now because we're only now starting to uh, collect enough information to provide a uh, patient family um, dashboard so that they can see some of the data. But for instance, you can visualize the, the number of families in different uh, countries around the world who are already registered. I think some of the data that we're displaying already uh, uh, sort the different mutation uh, types identified for the families within the, the, the registry. And as we build more information, as we collect more information from the families, we'll be able to give a little bit of a richer data dashboard for you uh, to be able to experience uh, being able to follow your child's uh, symptoms and how they compare to the rest of the community. So we're looking forward to that developing and becoming even more useful as we get more data collected. So um, I would say we, I, I think that the CDKL5 registry provides many of what is really required of a modern patient registry in providing a um, families a convenient way for them to be able to share their data, to be able to visualize their data, and then also to learn about opportunities for clinical studies. We've now moved it into a multi-language platform, which of course then uh, uh, expands our uh, access to uh, families who might have had challenges with uh, with uh, enrolling before. Uh, and we're very excited about moving this forward uh, as our, our uh, community really requires it, as the, so many of these uh, clinical studies that Anna has been talking about um, have been developing. The novel therapeutics are gonna require um, uh, participation in uh, clinical trials. And we think that the CDKL5 registry is the best way for the families to remain up to date on those. So thanks so much. I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna give it over to Famita in a second. I would just say, if you need more information, please go to cdkl5registry.org where you can register or even log in. But if there are any questions at all, uh, uh, comments, questions, challenges, please also feel free to email me directly uh, at my found Lulu Foundation email, dlavery at lulufoundation.org. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, uh, I think uh, one very important part of the CDKL5 registry is its ability to uh, function as a modern international patient registry with respect to uh, data uh, management, storage, collection, and uh, compliance. And so for this, I'd like to hand the, the floor over to my friend, Famita Gwadri Sridhar. Uh, Dr. Sridhar, Gwadri Sridhar is the um, founder and CEO of Pulse InfoFrame. Famita? Thank you, Dan. Thanks so much. Um, 
I think somebody's controlling the video, so I will just start my video. Great. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about security and the regulatory and GDPR standards. And I think one of the biggest considerations when people are sharing data is where is my data going? Is it secure? And how do people get access to our data? Just by way of background, um, Pulse Info Frame is a global company with over 80 sites. We've built over 25 registries. 19 of those are global registries. So the consideration of privacy, security, where data is stored and how it's used is a really important uh, component of how we think about you know, working with patient advocacy groups, as well as all of the other stakeholders, including pharma, biotech, and key opinion leaders. So um, maybe with that, Dan, the next slide would be great. So I always think about security and we, people think about security, um, you know, secure doesn't mean that it's locked up in a vault and nobody can use it. Security means really for us that it's role-based access. And what that means is when you sign on to the patient portal on the patient facing side, you have a password that you set and that's secure for you. Nobody else can get into your portal unless you provide permission as a proxy. And it's the same thing with a key opinion leader or researcher at a site who's going to be accessing the system. So we need to make sure that the data that are provided are in a securitized format. And what that means is that everybody has to sign in using their own credentials. So our vision in terms of what we wanted to do working with the Lulu Foundation and the CDKL5 community was to really collect high quality data. Quality data is not just, you know, popping it into an Excel spreadsheet, which is fine, but you may or may not be aware that the FDA had put out some guidance about the importance of real world data, real world meaning everything that comes um, outside of a clinical trial, but may help inform the creation of new studies and new hypotheses, and then continue to follow patients over time, similar to the observational study that Anna described, which is really critical. To do that, the data have to be in a regulatory grade format. And that means that they have to be mapped. So you'll see that the solution that we have provided here has that regulatory grade data. Why is that important? Because as patients come in from all over the world, we need to make sure that those data are actually structured in the same way that are going to be available for research, for analysis, and for you in your dashboards that Dan showed you. And that may seem like something trivial, but really it isn't because that, let's say you call something high blood pressure. I define the same thing as hypertension. We both mean the same thing, but if we don't say it exactly the same way and it isn't structured the same way in the infrastructure, then in fact, it's much harder to work with these data. And so essentially that's what our solution provides. Now, we know that high quality data can also be used for all of these things that are so important for the CDKL5 community, the CDD community, and Anna has described some of those, so I won't go into them. And I'll go to the next slide, really, that uh, will focus more on um, you know, GDPR and some of the considerations. So think about how you come into the patient registry. You come in through a patient portal. And in that portal, you are invited to participate there is a consent form that is provided. And that consent form is another mechanism to ensure that we have your consent to collect the data. We also then, as Dan noted, ask for consent to be able to share your data with groups like Helen Leonard's. And we do that in a very secure way using a token. So your data doesn't actually fly across the ocean. And I say that because if you think about it from the analogy of airplanes, right? Airplanes can fly in certain airspace and those have to be approved in advance. I would say that GDPR is really not much different, uh, that the data that you're providing and that sites are providing can't just fly anywhere in the world. It has to be in a specific um, federated environment in specific clouds, meaning that it has to go into certain countries and some of the data can't flow into other countries. And this is what you know GDPR also ensures that the patient's rights are protected. And that's why consent forms are used and institutional review boards are also used to protect the data and to protect 
the fidelity, as well as the patient's rights within this process. So essentially, what happens is that any of these components that you see here are sitting in the same environment, but ultimately each of those have different consents tied to them. And so I go now to the research portal. And in the research portal, this is where Dan was talking about, you know, access to data, um, access to dashboards, et cetera. Those are all de-identified data. A researcher who wants to be able to access data has to go through and apply uh, through a scientific advisory board to ensure that those data are being utilized in the, in the way that really addresses the needs of the community and advances research in some way. So in other words, nobody's going into the, re into the data to just look at things for no reason. There has to be a reason. In doing that, we de-identify the data or pseudonymize the data. And what does that mean? It means that we take out key data variables that in fact um, could potentially be used to re-identify a patient. So there is an extra step of privacy and security through the role-based access where people have to sign in. And even then the data are provided in aggregate, meaning that no individual patient can be identified as an individual. So, um, you know, this sounds pretty pedantic here. So I will just, you know, tell you that essentially we have set this up in a way that the data are stored securely. Um, all of the cloud provisioning that we use right now is in Canada. And that's an important consideration because some countries do not allow their data to flow outside of certain jurisdictions. For example, European data um, cannot easily flow into the United States. Canadian data from patients originating in Canada cannot easily flow into the United States. So there are a lot of legal processes involved. And Canada has specific provisions with Europe under a trade agreement and a data agreement that allow the data to be stored here. But where that changes, ultimately, we also have provisioning in other countries in Europe and other parts of the world, such as Australia. Remembering that this is a global registry, we also know that different countries have different rules. And so we ensure that our legal team advise us of any shifting in those rules because we have to adapt very rapidly to make sure that data are always protected and ultimately the ability to utilize those data are also um, ensured. So I think that, uh, Dan, I don't know if I missed anything in particular, but I just wanted to share you know, with, the, with the group here today that this is how this has been set up. And each of these components that you see here have different sign-on. Thank you.